Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. So glad you could join me here on Now TV. Look, before I get into uh, my video uh, and my program for this morning, here we are on December the 20th. I, and obviously, you know, Christmas is coming up. I just want to take this opportunity to wish you a very, very happy and safe holiday season. You know, I happen to be one of those individuals. I don't believe December 25th is when Jesus was born. But that doesn't mean that I don't celebrate a wonderful time of year in which people are, generally speaking, more friendly than, than they are during the rest of the, of the year. They're more courteous and kind and generous and, and what have you. And needless to say, the opportunity to be with family and enjoy family. Uh, look, nothing beats that, all right? Again, I, I just don't believe that December 25th is when Jesus was born. But do you know what? I celebrate his life every single day of my life. The birth, the life, the ministry, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus is the very foundation of my life. And I'm sure it is so many of you as well. And so... You know, while the world sort of kind of stops to celebrate this time of year, and of course, I don't have to tell you how commercialized, how secularized Christmas has become on television and in movies in the mass media. I mean, it's gotten to the point in, in, in commercials in which they are now promoting drinking of alcohol during the Christmas season, as if that is what Christmas is all about. Uh, I mean, it, it really honestly uh, is deplorable. I saw a, co a commercial just the other day. It was crass. It had sexual innuendo in it. And it was like, enjoy the season. Uh, th this shows you, really honestly, uh, the links to which the corruption of, of the uh, unbelieving mind is willing to stoop, uh, to take a time in which believers rejoice over the life of Jesus and to turn it into an exhortation to drinking and debauchery, uh, it's, it's reprehensible. And the very idea that television stations would run that kind of a commercial just simply shows you what they think of the reality of this time of year. They don't care anything about Christianity. They don't care anything about Jesus. So it's wonderful that those of us who really do honestly believe in Jesus, we focus on him, we focus on his life, we focus on what he has done for us. Now, again, since this is the Christian and Christmas season, I want to give you a little bit of a Christmas present, okay? We are currently taking a look at Matthew 16, 27, and 28, in which Jesus said, The Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angels and shall reward every man according as his works shall be. And verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now, I have to tell you, these verses have perplexed, puzzled biblical scholars, commentators, literally for centuries, going all the way back and even before, but to the days of David Strauss. And when he came to these passages, it was like, I do not know how to explain this. Jesus failed. He did not come. I've shared with you the quote from Rudolf Bultmann, tremendous biblical scholar in many ways. He came to these verses and he said, every schoolboy knows Jesus said he was coming back in the first century uh, at the end of human history. Every schoolboy knows he didn't do it. History has marched on. I, look, I've been sharing with you the challenge of Jesus. We have to equip ourselves 
to be able to answer the challenge of the atheists, the Muslims, and the Jews who deny that Jesus came. And look, I was raised struggling with these verses. I was raised trying to explain them away by saying, okay, verse 27, that's the end of, the time, end of time. Verse 28, that's Pentecost. And I broke up the grammatical flow. I, I broke up the flow of the text. And it wasn't until I started taking a look at the Greek, started taking a look of the grammatical scru- structure and the linguistics that I realized you cannot divide those verses. So the question naturally arose, okay, if I cannot divide verse 27 from verse 28, how am I going to explain that? Are there any 2,000-year-old people running around today waiting to see the coming of the Lord in judgment? Uh, By the way, some Mormons believe there are. It's utterly beyond the scope of believability. But nonetheless, when confronted with the text, they see the problem. So as I said a moment ago, we have to equip ourselves to be able to answer the challenge. With that in mind, Merry Christmas, okay? I have written three books. One of them based squarely on Matthew 16, 27, and 28. Actually, I've written about 32 books. But anyway, um, like Father, like Son, on clouds of glory. This is an in-depth exegesis of what Jesus meant when he said, He was coming in the glory of the Father. Now, if you haven't watched my previous videos in which I explain that and I show you what he meant, let me urge you to go back into the archives of Now TV and and spend some time because it's so easily documentable that Jesus did not have in mind his coming out of heaven as a five foot five Jewish man in a physical flesh, blood, bone body. Absolutely had no, no such an idea in mind. Anyway, this book, I've written another book, Blast from the Past, The Truth About Armageddon. I want to tell you what, folks, this is a groundbreaking book that has literally changed the lives or the life of thousands of people. And then the resurrection of Daniel chapter 12 Verse 2, fulfilled or future. Now, obviously, Jesus is coming in Matthew 16, 27. It is the time of the judgment. It's the time of the kingdom. What that means, it's the time of the resurrection. The resurrection foretold by Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Now, if you purchased, if you went to my website, donkpreston.com, and you purchased all three of these books separately, they would cost you $61 plus. However, Merry Christmas. <laughs> for, the rest of, for the rest of December 2019, for continental U.S. orders, all right? I'm sorry, I can't, cannot do this for uh, out of U.S. orders. But for continental U.S. orders, your total delivered price is $40, saving you over $21. I mean, this is absolutely fantastic. I mean, this, uh, you know, th- this book alone is normally $21.95. So for the price of three books, or the, for the price of one book, almost, you're getting all three. Take advantage of that. Go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. There'll be a banner right up at the top. And just click on it, march you right through. You can pay with PayPal. Or or if you wish some other form of payment, just contact me, okay? But uh, look, take advantage of this special, hello, Merry Christmas offer to you. All right. So as I said, we are examining Jesus' prophecy in these two verses in Matthew 16, 27, and 28. Now, needless to say, many, many attempts have been made to explain, more properly, to explain away 
the force and the power and the significance of Matthew 16, 27, and 28. And over the next few weeks, several weeks probably, I'm going to be examining those objections. I'm going to be examining the recommendations, the explanations that are given by the various commentators to avoid the really, really obvious meaning of Jesus' words. Uh, and look, you, you, you really do honestly have to catch the power of this. The explanations that we will, I will be sharing with you are not explanations which take the text at its face. Oh, no, 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 no. The explanations that I'm going to share with you and examine, review, and refute are explanations that have literally been invented in order to avoid the clear-cut, clear explicit, and emphatic meaning of Jesus' words. Now, let me ask you this. If you were to sit down, do the very, very best that you can to put out of your mind anything and everything you've ever been taught about Matthew 16, 27, 28, and read it without interjecting anything into the text. When Jesus said, the Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with His angels and reward every man according as his work shall be, and verily I say unto you, there are some standing here, that was 2,000 years ago, which shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Would you, upon a simple, straightforward, you know, uh, unembellished, as it were, reading of this text, would you ever get the idea, number one, that he was talking about an event 2,000 years away and counting? Would you ever get the idea that he was talking about something other than his coming in judgment? And I'll explain what I mean by that here in just a few moments. Would you not undeniably understand that somehow, some way, perhaps in a way that is challenging to our preconceived ideas? You know, in, in last week's video, I urged you, I challenged you, that we must be willing to change our preconceived ideas about the nature of the coming of the Lord and bring them into conformity with what the Bible actually says about the nature of the day of the Lord. And again, I, I have to tell you, I, I fully understand, I, I fully sympathize, I fully empathize with that struggle. Because just like you, almost certainly, I was raised believing that the coming of the Son of Man with the angels in judgment had to occur at the end of time. It came as a shock to me. It was a challenge to my preconceived ideas to learn the things that I have been sharing with you over the last several weeks. By the way, let me make an adjustment very, very, very quickly. Thank you. So when, when I learned the things that I've been sharing with you, I was stunned. But I was also excited. You know why? Because I finally had an answer. I had the answer to the challenge of Christ. What did Jesus challenge us with? John 10, 37 and following? Do not believe me for my word's sake. Believe me for my works. If I do not do the works which the Father has given me, do not believe me. Look, folks, Matthew 16, 27, and 28, that's the work, part of the work that the Father gave the Son. 
to come in judgment, to come in reward, to come in the kingdom. So here is Jesus. This is his challenge to us that if he didn't do it, we are not even to believe in him. Men like David Strauss, men like Rudolf Bultmann, see all these books back here behind me? These are all relatively very, many of them, very common scholars. They come to Matthew 16, 27, and 28, and they tell us, well, you know, we all know, uh, yeah, he, uh, he didn't come. History didn't end. Time marches on. That's not satisfactory. Not if we are going to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. So, let us turn our attention then to one of the more common explanations, uh, attempts to explain Matthew 16, 27, and 28. And this explanation carries a lot of weight with an awful lot of people. These commentaries back here, my, my, my. Very, very commonly, pardon me, these commentators say, well, you know, the, the obvious answer to explain the conundrum of Matthew 16, 27, and 28 is the transfiguration. Let me read. It'll take a moment or two, but I hope you have your Bible. Oh, and by the way, I hope you have your notebook, okay? But let's read together. Matthew chapter 17, 1 and following. Now, is there some kind of a connection here? Oh, I believe there is. I believe there is. But it's not what the commentators try to tell us. So, once again, reading Matthew 17, 1 and following. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain, on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shined like the sun. His clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you, please catch the power of this, folks. Elijah has already come, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them about John the baptizer. Now, we're going to have to spend some time here, all right, because this text is absolutely full of meaning. It, 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 I mean, it's incredible. I consider, by the way, I consider the, the trans, Transfiguration vision one of the most significant eschatological verses and passages and events in the entirety of the New Testament. If you take the position 
that the transfiguration explains Matthew 16, 27, and 28, then it's about his coming. Well, guess what? That means it's about his coming in judgment. It's about his coming in the kingdom. Well, that's real problematic, as we shall see as we proceed. But make no mistake, okay? Hear me very, very carefully. The transfiguration, number one, was a vision. Now, don't misunderstand here. The word vision doesn't mean unreal, and it doesn't mean dream. It doesn't mean object, uh, doesn't rule out the objective nature of what they saw. It was a vision. It's something they saw objectively, truly, historically. So don't let the word vision throw you off here, okay? But the vision of the transfiguration was without any doubt whatsoever, as we shall prove in the coming weeks, a vision of the second coming of Christ. That means that if we examine Matthew 17 and we can determine what Matthew 17 reveals to us, we can understand the nature of and the timing of the transfiguration. By the way, the transfiguration, as, as I've already hinted to you, uh, is one of my very, very favorite subjects. I've written about it extensively in this book, Like Father, Like Son, On Clouds of Glory. Uh, like I said, I consider the transfiguration to be the most significant eschatological event in the New Testament, obviously apart from Christ himself. But it's about him, isn't it? So let me reiterate what I just said. If we can understand properly the transfiguration, what they actually saw, the meaning of what they saw, the application of what they saw, and the time when it would be fulfilled... I want to suggest to you, as I point out in this book, Like Father, Like Son on Clouds of Glory, it will radically change our view of the nature of the coming of the Lord, the nature of the coming of the kingdom, the nature of the end of the age, the nature of the resurrection itself. That's how important the transfiguration really is. Now, as we get started here, uh, and, and obviously I don't have much time left, okay, for today's program. But we notice that after six days, after about six days, it's just a rough figure, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the mountain. <clears throat> he was transfigured. Now, the, the Greek word that is used there is metamorpho. Metamorphosis. You know that word, don't you? It's when a caterpillar, a little worm, spins its cocoon around it. It's wrapped up in that cocoon, and when it is matured, what happens? It breaks itself out of that cocoon. And if you've ever seen it, I suggest you probably have. The transformation that has taken place, I mean, it literally blows our mind, doesn't it? From that ugly little worm, all of a sudden this beautiful, this glorious butterfly emerges. Folks, that, that metamorphosis, meta means after, morphe, form. It is a change of form. That's what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
Now, I want you to catch the power of what I'm about to say. Jesus went up on the mountain as a five foot five Jewish man in a physical body of flesh, of blood, and bone. He was so radically transformed, changed in form. That's what metamorphosis means. Change of form. That his apostles, I mean, look, look how it describes this, okay? His face shined like the sun. Let me ask you a question. Had that ever happened before? During his personal ministry? Had Jesus' face ever shined like the sun? And, you know, by the way, when we look at Mark chapter 9 and Luke chapter 9 in their description, they struggle. You, you can tell they struggle to find the proper words to describe the radical transformation in Jesus' appearance. His face shined like the sun. His clothes, now notice what Matthew says, his clothes became as white as, white as the light. What light? The light of the sun. That's the meaning of that. So once again, had Jesus in his incarnate form of a five foot five Jewish man in flesh, blood, and bone, had his clothes ever shined like the sun? Well, you know it hadn't. Now, what's the point here? Well, let me jump ahead to where we're going eventually. We're told that in Acts chapter 1, as Jesus ascended, and he ascended in his flesh, his blood, bone, it was not in any way resembling what happened in Matthew 17. As he ascended, the angel said he'll come in like manner. And we were told, ah, see, that means he's coming back in flesh, blood, and bone. Wait a minute. If Matthew chapter 27 is a vision of Christ's second coming, then it's not a vision of him coming in a flesh, blood, and bone body. And folks, we've got a whole lot more. So I'll see you next week.